Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Life After GDPR podcast, where we discuss digital marketing in a post-GDPR world. In today's episode, I interview Jordan Peck. Jordan is a solu solution architect at Snowplow. And um, this is actually the first time that I decided to talk to a vendor on the podcast. So please share your thoughts with me about uh, how we handled this topic and if it was valuable to you as a listener. Um, I personally like Snowplow a lot. I wish we would do more with it in our day-to-day -day business. Hopefully we will in the future. Uh, I think it's a really powerful platform that has a lot of uh, possibilities, especially if the maturity of the organization moves up a bit. In today's episode, we mainly focus on how Snowplow can help you from a data privacy perspective. Uh, so, you know, let's assume you are on uh, Google Analytics right now and you're evaluating whether you want to move away from that for obvious reasons um, and what, how Snowplow could potentially be a alternative and what features it has. Short disclaimer before we dive in, I am not a lawyer, Jordan is not a lawyer, and nothing that we say on this podcast is legal advice. So without any further ado, let's dive in with Jordan Peck from Snowplow. Cool. Jordan, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Rick. How you doing? Doing well, doing well. So you work for Snowplow. You guys are uh, the, the first vendor on the Life After GDPR podcast. So let's get that out of the way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank I'll, I'll, I'll take the chance to introduce myself. Um, I'm Jordan, Jordan Peck. I am a strategic solutions architect. Uh, Snowplow Analytics, or Snowplow IO, as we are now. Um, I have worked for Snowplow for very close to two years now. Um, however, before joining Snowplow team, I was um, a real life web analyst. Did a lot of Google Analytics work, a lot of GTM, BigQuery, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, was an analytics consultant for a little while. Uh, we were background in digital uh, marketing and, and digital analytics as well. Um, was also a Snowplow customer about four or five years ago um, when I first came across Snowplow when they were uh, significantly smaller than we are now uh, and uh, really, really loved the product. thought it was one of the best that, I, that I'd seen in the space. And then when the opportunity came uh, a couple of years ago to come join the team, I was uh, very, very, very ecstatic to, to get the chance to join. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, so... Uh... We have very, uh, very similar backgrounds. It's also why, uh, why I invited, invited you on the podcast because I know that we can, uh, you know, we we see things in the same way. You know, you know the problems I ran into as a, as a, as a digital analytics consultant with my clients. So before we dive into snowplow and privacy, which is obviously you know the angle for for the the podcast, could you give a quick overview for the listeners, like? What is Snowplow? And perhaps also highlight the difference between the open source part and what you guys are doing, because it is a for-profit business next to it. So, so Snowplow is, uh, at heart, a, beha a behavioral data platform. Um, it is a uh, system for creating and collecting uh, the best quality uh, behavioral data uh, about your users and your customers across various different platforms. So whether that be web, mobile, uh, IoT, server-side applications, desktop applications, wearables, all that kind of stuff. Um, we have cloud native, so we run on AWS or Google Cloud Platform and load your data in real time into a warehouse of your choice. Current uh, supported destinations are BigQuery, Redshift, Snowflake, and Databricks. Um, as you mentioned, the core of our product is open source. All of our code is on GitHub, all of the code for our tracking SDKs, all of the uh, cloud applications that we use to process and enrich, uh, validate the data and, and load into the data warehouses is all uh, open source. So if you are a technically advanced company with a, a set of smart data engineers, you can take all of our source code and run it all of your all yourself on, on, on your own cloud, uh, of which several people do. Uh, we have a, a very, very um, large and engaged open source um, community and... It's hard to track sometimes, but we think it's in the region of several thousand businesses uh, using uh, Snowplow open source. So, I, um, uh, Gusto in the UK do, Trello, who uh, went by Atlassian, is certainly, certainly used to. I think CNN and the New York Times are, are big open source users um, as well. 
Uh, but yeah, as you mentioned, I work for Snowblown. We are a for-profit business, so we offer um, a paid alternative where essentially um, you come to us and we manage running that Snowplow uh, pipeline for you. So as we mentioned, all of the code is on GitHub, but it's uh, it's uh, to use a slightly outdated term, it's a big data platform, right? There's lots of services. I think mean, there's like 40 or 70 services across the two clouds that, that, uh, that we build and maintain. It can be a challenge to run that effectively at a high scale and make sure everything you know, continues to work and doesn't fall over. So you can offload that responsibility um, to us and we will run it for you. Um, however, uh, this is probably going to be quite a key point of our discussion today. As part of our paired service, we are not pure SaaS. What we are called, we, we coin it private SaaS. So the tech is SaaS. We, we build it, we maintain it. However, um, we deploy all of our pipeline infrastructure into the customer's uh, cloud accounts. So customer comes along, they are, um, open up a, a, a brand new empty AWS sub account or GCP project. We deploy all our infrastructure into that environment and then we remotely monitor it. So we, you know, make sure that, you know, if your servers need expanding or we will patch updates for you, send new, you know, upgrades and things like that and um, keep the, keep the lights on. Uh, for you. So you offload all of that management up running the pipeline uh, to us, uh, pay us a fee, and um, you also get people like me to come to tell you how to how to use it most effectively. Yeah, I've, so I've, we, have a, we have a couple of clients that uh, that use this service from you. So basically they, you could say they, they outsource their data engineering, sort of, to you guys, right? Yeah, so for, for, yeah, for, the, for this prospect, yeah. And, and, and it is also very, very technically sophisticated companies still do this, uh, mainly because they just don't want to have to do it. They've got all of their own systems that they're busy managing and running. And, you know, if they, you can get a, an enterprise-grade cloud piece of software that just is managed and run for you and they don't have to worry about it. They just send data to it and consume data out of it. They're very, very happy. So uh, it's quite a nice model. It lends itself to a lot of... Um, uh, privacy benefits, which we're going to talk about today, uh, this uh, deployment model, um, as well as a lot of other features we've built across the product uh, for this kind of uh, consideration. It's, it's it's interesting. I was I just thought about it. Like it's it's not real SaaS, like you said. It's a it's it's a slightly different model. But uh, f- from a privacy perspective, it's exactly what you would want because the benefit, of course, being I create my own Google Cloud platform account or AWS. I own it, I own everything inside it, and I give you guys rights. And if I want to throw you guys out, I could throw you guys out. Still probably have to pay you if I throw you out, but <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, you know, but the data is mine, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah, you control, you know, um, that, that does happen sometimes. We've had customers kick us out and then we go, like, you're paying a managed service and we're, we're not able to manage it. That does happen from time to time. Uh, thankfully, not as much, I think, as it used to. Um, uh, but yeah, um, data, never leaves uh, your own servers inside your cloud. And we only have access to it to, to, for monitoring. We don't have access to the data to, to, to do anything. It never flows through our servers. So your data that you're collecting on your own users never hits any server or infrastructure that we own. Um, and we, we, we sometimes we do get access to customer's data, but only with you know, permission and uh, time-bounded permission um, rights for us to do specific actions. Um, so yeah, we, we, we take it very seriously. Like we, we, um, we take it extremely seriously because, um, it, it's, it's, it's very important, um, now more than ever. Okay. So, so let, so let's look at snowplow through, through my lens, right? So I'm, I'm a consultant helping a lot of companies with Google tag manager, Google analytics. And of course, you know, depending on when this airs, we will know if, you know, in how many countries Google analytics is or is not <laughs> legal, right? Um, but that's an issue, right? So people have this fear and they have alternatives. Uh, I, I wrote a blog post. I actually, I presented on this, this uh, framework and then you, you were there as well. So we had a nice discussion about it at measure camp, which is you have like these three options of either you're going to fight it. Like you want to stay in the Google ecosystem and you're going to hire lawyers and you're going to, you know, optimize your implementation, make it as, I don't know, GDPR proof as possible, I would say. Let's park that option because we're not going to discuss that today. But that's one of them, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then and then you can you can fly. You you can either move backwards or or forwards. And backwards, 
I would say is a little bit downgrading to like, let's call them simpler analytics solutions. So there's, there's a bunch of solutions out there. Uh, well, the, the, the French DPA listed a, a whole list of solutions that they, they say are GDPR proof. Gen, gen, gen tips, objective, uh, there's a, there's a number of them. Uh, um, uh, Fathom, I think is another one. Yeah. And the Matomo, Piwik, those kind of, uh, solutions. Uh, I, I'm not necessarily saying they're bad, but I, I do think they are, they are either on par with Google Analytics or a little bit subpar, I would normally say. They haven't had the developments that a company like Google can allow to, to put into a product, right? Exactly. But also, I feel like they are also geared more towards, let's call it simple web analytics, or, or not necessarily simple, but really geared at web analytics. Whereas the more complex use cases, you often see that the need arises to integrate multiple sources and to create a, a wider thing. And you saw Google Analytics also with GA4 is also moving in that direction with a more, you know, with the event based model. And then I feel snowplow comes into the picture, right? Like once you start looking at, okay, I want something more advanced, even before all the privacy stuff, snowplow usually came on the short list for, for people like, Hey, this is something it's going to take more work to do, but, um, it, it, it has some additional value, uh, when you look at it like that. Yeah, and and just to put your listeners and viewers' minds at rest, I'm not going to dive into a sales pitch. That's not why I'm here. But um, the, the, you know, I would think this, but you know, I think Snowplow is 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 the most advanced and best product in the market for doing the more advanced uh, analytics from multiple sources in real time, um, in the most granular detail, you know, with the most uh, custom properties and flexible schemas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if you're interested, Snowplow IO. I speak to a salesperson, <laughs> but um, it that has definitely been the way we've been positioned, certainly since when I was a customer. Um, if you are really, really serious about taking your web analytics as seriously, as seriously as a business takes the rest of its data, you know, data warehousing has been around for like 30 years now. People have been doing uh, data science uh, on, on business data for a very, very long time in like logistics and, um, you know, supply chain and uh, trade trade in and stuff like that. If you want to take your web analytics as seriously and your marketing analytics as seriously as, as, as that, a tool like Snowblow is one of the best options uh, for it because of the, the flexibility that you get. You know, it's, 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 the, it's the trade-off of a lot of things you can customize and, and it is very flexible, but then obviously, you know, it's not like, it's not plug and play. Here's your JavaScript snippet and good luck. You know, like that's the, that's the, that's the trade of you. You're going to have to, you, you need a team of people to, uh, to maintain it. If you're definitely, if you're going to go the open source route. We've, we've made efforts to make Snowplow easier to use, but again, that it's sort of, uh, I would certainly say the historic opinion of Snowplow is that it is more effort, but it's, it will provide more value at the end of it. If you're willing to put that effort in and yeah, yeah exactly. Like you need uh, people who can write SQL, you need people who can, uh, understand how to. Uh, derive value and create meaningful data out of uh, a big data warehouse, uh, etc. So, exactly like I'm saying, like we we are putting efforts in to make it easy to get value quicker, more easy to set up, easier to use for more people, more personas. Um, but in essence, it is a more technical product than install GA and GTM, get some pretty report in the GA interface. It's that's not that's not the market we're filling. Yeah, so I, I recorded a podcast with uh, with Timo Dechau uh, last week, and um, in there we were also d exploring like when, what type of uh, analytics tool um, is valuable, and, and and one of the things we we figured out like you have to you have to kind of highlight the core value of data to your company, right? So so if you take in a let's say a travel company and you figure out that the way their search algorithm and like what what trip to show to the to the visitor at what moment you know based on what you know about the user and their search behavior that can actually you know be a be a huge improvement on on conversion rates and then you realize like okay data is now it's no no longer just about calculating did my google ad spend you know did my click generate this much money but it's integral part of your of your business and there's a lot of business models where that's the case 
it's 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 building data products and data apps um where and, and even even in the analytics space like the reporting you know you can build you can still use you can still think of it as a data product or an application in that sense like this is my uh trading reporting data application or to use your example in terms of real activation like you know this is my search product that i am uh, optimizing through the use of uh, data we're, we're we're observing from our from our users. Recommendation engines are a lot of, are, are another popular one uh, that we have a lot of people interested in. Um, uh, exactly, yeah. So, um, which I which I think is a really really um, having been an analyst for a long time, I think it's really a really nice thing to see in the market that analysts that data and analysts aren't cost centers. Like it isn't like. You know, yeah, it, like people always think like data is actually just like you know um you say this little bubble requests come in and powerpoints come out <laughs> and and uh that can be a bit demoralizing really i you know i did it for a long time and to see that actually the perspective now is that you can build data products which actually like drive value and in- increase you know top line bottom line increase improve customer experience improve stickiness etc cetera, etc cetera, i think is a is a really, really nice thing to see in the industry. Yeah, I think all tools were slowly moving towards that point, but I think Snowplow was really redesigned from the ground up, or not redesigned, was invented from the ground up with with these kind of use cases. Uh, if you look at the early presentations of uh, of Alex and uh, uh, yeah, uh, Yali, I think, right? Yeah, their, their early presentations already... No, with the old logo, with the with, with the, with with the actual, actual snowplow. Snow <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I love the story from um, uh, Alex and uh, was used to say like we used to Alex and Yali both used to be consultants, our two co-founders, and they were going to a business and they say, oh, can we have access to your you know to your transactional data? And they go, sure, here's the data warehouse, and they'd have all this flexibility to you know slice and dice and join and manipulate the data as they wished, and then they say. They used to get like given DVDs of like exports of the data warehouse so they could do the analysis. Don't mean that would fly in a GDPR uh, <laughs> environment, would it? Um, but yeah, and then they say, "Oh, you've got a really nice website. You've got a lot of users on. Can we can we analyze that?" And they say, "Oh yeah, sure. Here's a GA login." And it'd be like, "Oh, it's not not quite the sort of experience that we wanted. Really, like, it would be so good to be able to do the same type of analytics we're doing with." The other transactional and operational data, we would love to do that with the web data. And they thought, there's got to be a tool for that. There wasn't. So uh, that was what um, Snowfall was built uh, for the purpose of. And um, yeah, those more advanced use cases, those more uh, complex, but ones that ultimately generally drive more value. The, the GDPR perspective and data privacy and security is, you know, it's, so it's also something else we've taken very seriously, but. You know, people want to build data apps it, like we've been discussing while still being, you know, GDPR compliant or respecting users' privacy. Um, it, it just seems like it adds, it, it seems like it might make it more unattainable because it seems like you've got even more things to overcome before you can start doing these things. So we take it very seriously in, 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 in uh, making sure that you can still use a plot to do those, those, um, those advanced use cases while still respecting uses privacy so the first obvious thing is what, what we already tackled right so so the fact that snowplow will always either if you guys manage it or if i do it open source it's it probably should always be in my ownership like I, technically it could you know i could set it up on somebody else's cloud and then put it on my website but let's assume i don't do such a thing so that's the first part right so the data ownership is always first party so where the data ends up like bigquery or redshift whatever but also the collectors, right? You're, so you're you're gonna run the whole the whole pipeline will run on your own cloud infrastructure. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's by default, by default, by design. That is by design. Yeah, and you can add in your governance policies, retention policies, um, uh, cleaning, and you know, um, archiving, or you know, move data for cold storage or deletion. If you know, you would you say. You know, we don't want our logs to contain more than thirty days worth of, of of data. We'll 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 archive them or delete them after a certain time period. We only want these very uh, sorry. We only want people to access data uh, with these particular policies. Only these types of people can access this type of data under these types of circumstances. All of that's configurable. Like we don't we don't enforce any of that. Um, it's um, 
it, 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 it's entirely up to uh, how you want to, you know, control your data and your data access and, and the governance around it. Yeah, it's all it's all possible. I, I would say it, it might be interesting for you guys to have a to create a GDPR best practice implementation way for Snowplow. You know, where you where you basically suggest if you if you want to take privacy as serious as possible, then you would want to do all these settings in this way. It's difficult, right? I mean. I mean, first of all, there's a the legal side of that, isn't it? Like, you don't, what we, do, we really don't, we don't ideally want to be told at some point by a customer that says, Snowfall told us to do this. <laughs> and, then, and then we end up on the hook for if they've done something horrendously wrong. Um, but um, I was, and, and there's also, there's also considerations, right? For like, if you're saying, you know, we'd, we'll, we'll trash all the data that stays in our logs or our streaming platform, we'll trash them after like seven days. Um, which is fine, except um, uh, there are there are other implications of doing that. Right, I was speaking to a customer yesterday about this. Um, about let's say one of the things with Snowflow is if an event is failed for whatever reason because it's not the right format or something, we don't like silently drop it. We actually store it in in cloud storage. Um, let's say you stick a, a retention policy or a lifecycle policy to delete data after every seven days. That um, those failed events can be reprocessed. You can essentially correct them and send them back to the pipeline. But if you've only got seven days worth of retention, you've only got seven days to action that. Yeah, you need to be on top of it. Yeah, exactly. So there is a balance. You know, um, if we if we say if you really want to be privacy conscious, you delete it every day or every twenty four hours or something. But um, if you do that, then you end up opening yourself up to some of these like data. Uh, the gaps in your data because you don't have time to reprocess it. So there is a balance that has to be made there. Yeah, and definitely you 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 wouldn't want to make a recommendation that this is GDPR compliant. But like you said, you maybe give a recommendation on this is the most this is the most privacy friendly way you could configure Snowplow in theory. And this is not legal advice, right? <laughs> that that kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not a lawyer. I find myself saying that a lot these days. <laughs> That's on the data retention policy side. Let, let's talk about the uh, about the data collection. Because if we take Google Analytics again as an example, then um, it starts like all, all the issues start off with the identifier, right? Like the the cookie, the whatever, the, the way you're gonna stitch it all together. Um, and by default, the framework for well, at least for Universe Analytics, right, was was user session. Uh, page view and now for GA4 there's still like the, the user identifier still the GA cookie the, the client ID yeah exactly um, so how, how does this look from a how can or how does this look by default or how can this look as well uh, from a snowplow point of view yeah so we on web we do uh, sort of cookie identifiers uh, on mobile we use um, uh, device identifiers uh, a user identifier that's tied to the installation of the app um but we do it in a we do it a slightly different way than Google. So we actually place multiple cookies. We're focusing on web for a second. Um, we place multiple cookies. We place um, a first party JavaScript uh, created cookie, uh, which is very similar to like you know the FBQ for Facebook or GA client ID. Um, you know, set the document dot cookie sets cookie, and by default it will run uh, expires after a year. So that's the sort of like normal out-of-the-box cookie identifier. Uh, we also place session ID because we do client-side sessionization. Um, there's also the, 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 that domain user ID is what we call it. Sorry, the, the, that cookie ID um, is like every other web analytics cookie, like the client ID, it's set in the browser. Um, and um, it, it, it's, it's susceptible to ITP for one. So uh, ITP truncating it down to seven days or if you have the enhanced version on just, just 24 hours. Um, which is a bit problematic, but um, yeah, so that's the main one. We also can place another cookie, which is actually one set by our uh, pipeline, by set by our server. So a very common pattern that uh, Snowflow users and customers do is all of the Snowflow pipeline, you stick tracking.rickjonkers.com, you stick a first-party subdomain in front of it. We probably don't recommend people call it tracking dot something, but they, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, uh, analytics dot, um, my site.com. And then the whole snowball pipeline and the collection servers are now behind that domain. 
So then that cook, that server can set a cookie back to the browser. So if I'm on withdronkers.com and uh, tracking.withdronkers.com sends a cookie back, then that is um, also first party. It's and, and this is where I don't, I don't, I'm not usually familiar with the uh, uh, sort of wording around this, but because this is set by the same uh, domain that you are that the user is visiting, it is you know its own infrastructure. It's all first party, and um, rather than it being set by Google Python Analytics dot com, rather than being sent back, uh, uh, you know, by a third party like Facebook or something, and I know that this is very popular as well with GTM server sites. So people are trying to set their GTM server behind one of their own domains as well. And I know that people are, uh, are essentially trying to use it for exactly this purpose, right? To get around ad blockers and to get around um, tracking prevention methods and my dead spine as, as, as tracking uh, measures. That sounds a lot like um, the way server side tag manager right now is being uh is is being used of course disclaimer you should you should not use it right without consent of the user yeah which right? uh, which i mean <laughs> we, we will get into consent management in a, in a little bit but yes i mean like uh but maybe we can get to it right now like because you know yeah you can use this we call it network user ID, basically our server set cookie like yeah that will supersede things like itp that will probably duck ad blockers um and stuff but doesn't because you can doesn't mean you should you should still respect users users preferences you should still um only place those identifiers when relevant uh when the user is happy for you to do so um and i know google have, have done some work in this space with my consent manager uh consent moto um but we like we go even we have even more options uh, than that. We allow you to do full cookieless tracking, um, should you wish. Um, and again, <laughs> hashtag I'm not a lawyer, but if you can make the intention that um, even if the user doesn't grant consent, we'll just track raw events without cookie identifiers. So you can still do like event based analysis, page view based analysis, conversion. You know, did another did a page view take place on this page? Did a conversion happen? But no, no user identifiers, no cookies, no nothing. And then you might you might say that that's still legitimate interest in improving your site and improving your experience, but you don't know anything about the user who performed the action. Let's indeed park the the legal side of this, right? Let's assume that this, uh, the, you know, that that there's a way to to do this from a legal point of view. So then, my data set, there would be a large part of my data set, hopefully, that has a user identifier. Right for the from the people who consented, and then I can basically plot out how those users went through sessions, and also how they had multiple sessions, perhaps over longer periods of time. But then uh, another part of the data set would not be tied to users, but would simply be tied to what what would then be the the main aggregation? Would it be like on a page level, or is that up to you to decide? Like up to you to model? This is one of the things I often think. I, I actually mentioned it in my measure camp talk when we were both in, in London a few months ago. Like cookieless tracking sounds great from a you know privacy respecting perspective, but like if you want to do session based analysis and you don't place a session ID, <laughs> sorry, right? you know, um, and you want to do you need users or new versus returning, and you're not placing the user identifier, like you 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 you're, you're um, out of luck. So. But that isn't to say that the data isn't valuable. So um, you could say, um, yeah, you can still say most viewed pages. You can still say, like, did this form submission happen? Because you can still track that the form was submitted and maybe some of the values that were put into the form, um, depending on the on the use case. Um, you can still see that maybe a purchase was made and what products were in it, et cetera, et cetera. You can still track those as events. Um, but, you know, uh, tie in those conversion events or those events to a marketing channel might not be the case. We will still track UTM parameters, so you can still say you can, you can probably still count up page views by you know source equals email or something. So you can still do that kind of analysis as well. But this kind of like stitching it together into a coherent user journey um, 
it w- w- would not be enabled in this in this fashion. Having said that, um, so as I say, we we allow configuration options to do uh, anonymous or cookieless uh, uh, tracking. There's you know some nuance into the terminology there, but essentially what we allow you to do is you to actively, as I mentioned, turn off or on user ID tracking, session ID tracking, even like IP address tracking at, at the point of collection, actually in the tracking SDK on the website. Uh, and one quite popular pattern might be land on the website for the first time and I get the consent banner and I don't grant consent immediately because it's really small or I just, I'm just not bothered. And I click around, view a couple of pages, generate a few like events, and then I click consent, I click agree. At that point, you then deactivate anonymous tracking and then start placing those user identifiers and session identifiers. Um, and this, in theory, will allow you to actually backstitch, again, assuming that you've figured out to do this in a legal uh, 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 way. Uh, so, yeah, so you would have no user identifying track identifiers placed until, con- but you would have session identifiers in place pre consent. Then the user grants consent. Then you start placing user identifiers. And then because we load the data into your warehouse, you know, row by row, event by uh, one row per event, you can theoretically stitch back across those, those, um, those events that didn't have a user identifier because the user's now consented. Um, you can use that, use our section ID to stretch that back, which is a, a very popular pattern. Um, and we provide the tools uh, to do that. Yeah, that's one of the... Like whenever somebody starts working with Google Analytics and then they get a few years of experience and then they the, the wish for being able to update the data set like after it's been collected, that, that trigger is probably what drives most people to look at something like Snowplow at, a, at, a, at one point in time because that, that's... Yeah. I can't tell you, and I'm sure all, most of your listeners will be familiar with it, but I cannot tell you the amount of times I've screamed at my computer when I was a GA analyst. Like, you've sent the wrong data in. Oh no, it's like it's like this forever now, isn't it? You know, maybe with Google Analytics four, with, with you know, with BigQuery uh, on the back of it, you you know, you 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 can do a little bit of this, but of course, the the user interface will still uh, reflect what whatever you send in. But yeah, especially with use cases like this, like you know, identifying a user later on, and then even perhaps more interesting is the the cross device journey, right? Where where Eventually, you figure out that this is my laptop, this is my smartphone, and this is my tablet, but you don't figure that out at the same time. And maybe I've been already browsing some on my smartphone first and then on my tablet, and then I convert it on the laptop. And then, of course, the laptop gets all the conversion and the rest never gets tied back to it. That's also one of those use cases where, where yeah, a, a data set, you know, a tool like Snowplow and, a, and being able to backstitch uh, is so valuable. Yeah, user stitching is an extremely popular um, use case. Um, it, 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 it's relatively kind of classic standard. Like if you have an authenticated user who signs in and generates a user ID, you can track that as well in Snowplow as well as on the mobile app. So even though there's no such thing as a cookie on an iOS app, if I sign in and say I am Jordan at Snowplow.io and then I do the same on desktop, then I know that these two completely unrelated devices are now actually the same person. So I can do that cross browse, uh, cross device um, uh, activity stitching. Yeah, yeah, on historic data, right? Like doing it to the, to the like once people are logged in on all devices to the future data, that's that's the easy part. But also updating the old data, that's, that's where the interesting uh, stuff is, yeah. Going back to this uh, consent banner, like, so I land as an anonymous user on the website. I did not consent yet. At that moment, I have a session ID. And then let's say I don't consent. Session ID gets destroyed. So it will, it's a session cookie. So it's a 30 minute timeout. So if you don't do anything for 30 minutes, it will expire. Yeah. Um, and then the next time you come back, it will generate a new one. Uh, so, yeah. that, so that does place a cookie because it's the only way it can like yeah. keep, keep track of the time. Um, well, session cookies are considered obviously different to, to, to user cookies anyway. Uh, and since it expires after thirty minutes, then I'm, I think, yeah, yeah, I think it's generally fine. You can even, you can even. That's obviously configurable. You can even actually configure it down to like actual, like, uh, browser sessions. So um, if you set the timeout to zero, 
it will expire as soon as you close the tab. Well, probably like from a privacy point of view, uh, probably a probably a good option. Um, I, I would I would like to, like the more I talk to people who are deep into the whole privacy topic, the more I wonder like if is anything allowed? Like so, even like a session cookie, you know. But uh, we'll, we're gonna park that for this discussion. But I do I I like I like the the setup where okay, I, I come in as an anonymous user or a first you know first time visitor. I have a session cookie. If then a few clicks in, I do decide to to accept opt in to everything. Then, you know, the user cookie gets placed, and then uh, later on in the processing of the data, the few hits that I had before consenting get stitched to me. And otherwise, if I don't opt in, it just you know it 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 just stays separated. Yeah, and and as far as a Snowplow user, like an analyst in BigQuery knows, that's just a session. We can count it as a session. You can even yeah. like you can even fill in like this is the wonder of this is how wonderful SQL is. You can even like populate like a random value like as a user number, so you can still like count distinct users. Um, we even go one stage further. So one of the options that we also have is a consent uh, context, where I, I won't go too much into uh, Snowplow custom context, but the idea here is that you can actually attach to every single event you collect, you can attach the level of consent. That was granted. So you then have a column that says you got all your events row by row, and then a column in, in in your warehouse that says, "Well, this event was not consented. This event was not consented. This event was consented to marketing, but not advertising. This one was consented to everything." Um, you actually bundle that in. We call it self-describing data, right? You can actually bundle that in into the event that you send from the browser to your pipeline. So that becomes really easy. So if you're a marketing analyst who wants to, it's like you're. You're a digital ads guy, you do banner ads or something, you want to send an audience up to double click for a customer match, you can consent, you can filter the consent column for just uh, marketing and advertising, generate your segments and export it up to Google Ads, uh, excluding everybody who didn't consent it. I, I do this right now for um, an implementation where, where we, I think we use CookieBot there. But yeah, they all, they all they all give you know the same kind of output. But the, the the consent management platform basically gives you a couple of values back, right? Like what what did you consent for, yes or no? And then we we pass it along to GA4, not as a custom dimension, but in the BigQuery export, so that also when you get um, data deletion requests, so we also pass the unique consent string like from the consent management platform. And then when you get a data deletion request, at least in theory. You could delete it all. Like, still have to build a mechanism to actually do that. But, but uh, you know, at least the key is there to uh, to actually be able to do it. But like, um, I know when I first, when this first I kind of kicked up, it's you know kicked up in my face in my career. We were using uh, One Trust, so similar consent platform. But it was all that was all the consideration there was use One Trust to fire or not fire events as like a blocking method inside GTM rather than what we've just described, actually bundling in that consent level into the data itself, um, which is which is really what, which is kind of like, you know, it's the next logical step. And as we move to more to this sort of space, and um, we work with a lot of customers all over the world, they're, they're not quite as, in America, they're not quite as concerned about this because they haven't had their, um, they haven't had to hit them as hard as GDPR has. But uh, in Europe, especially, uh, this is a very, very you know, obviously big concern, and I was like, something you really should be considering. Whichever tool you're doing, like you're saying with, with Google Analytics, for well, you, you really should be bundling in the consent. We even give you the option to, you can even like, let's say you've got multiple versions of your privacy policy or your or, or, or your documents that refers to it. You can even bundle in which version of that document into your tracking. So as you make an update to your privacy policy, you change your tracking. So now we're, version, we're, we're referring to version six, not version five of the privacy policy. So you can actually see, you know, docu- audit through history how uh, your users have, uh, have consented over time and what they've consented to. Exactly, yeah. I, f- I, think, I think it's a no-brainer that if, if you want to continue to collect personal data, then adding, like, if there was a, if there was a form of consent, which I, f- I think there should probably be, uh, if it concerns personal data, then documenting uh, that consent will it will it will also make your life a lot easier if you if you ever need to uh, explain something or audit something. I think people who don't do it today will regret it in some years' time. It will very much bite them in the in the backside. 
probably, unfortunately, the people that follow them in that job will regret it. That's likely what's <laughs> going to happen, right? That's, it's like, uh, that's probably that's probably much fairer, uh, fair, fair to say, Eric. Um, I guess also on the topic of the other people say like, you know, are you GDPR compliant, etc. Like all of these tooling that I just talked about, and maybe this goes without saying, but like if you just abuse it, like people say like stuff as GDPR compliant. Well, if you send unconsented data and all of you know personal identifiable information about users to Snowplow, like you like, that doesn't you just using Snowplow doesn't make you GDPR compliant. Like you can still abuse the the you know the the, the tracking policies. You can still not listen to user um, consent and what users wishes. Like just you know. It shouldn't be here, and I'm certainly not going to be here and tell you listeners that if you sign up to this not like you're going to be GDPR compliant because that's just not true. Um, we have we offer a number of ways of dealing with sensitive data or you know private data that the users generate. So, so we've talked a lot so far about actually up the, the tracking side on the on the data collection side. We offer a number of tools actually sort of in the middle of the pipeline, like as through the processing. Um, over and above what we discussed earlier about it all already being in your own environment. So one of the things that we offer, uh, well, the big thing that kicked off the GA, was it, who was it first? Was it um, France or Austria? I think it was, wasn't it? They were the first one. Yeah, Austria were the first one. It was because GA contained IP address information and it was going up to Google. So one of the things that you can do is at a tracker level, you can block IP addresses ever been stored or collected. Um I do find it funny talking about IP addresses to certain privacy people because every um, HTTP request made on the internet has an IP address on it. That's how the internet works. You can't just not collect IP addresses. That's not how it works. Um, but you can disable uh, storing it right in the, in the level of the tracker, which is quite appealing. Um, we also offer a real-time truncation. So if your IP address is 1.2.3.4, you can say, I'll truncate the last octet. So it's 1.2.3.x. Um, so you don't know the user's IP address, but you know a certain user's on the same block, for instance, obviously, you know, on the same uh, subnet. I, I don't know what they're working. But um, so you can still, like, say, these groups of users maybe are all in the same office or something. Uh, you can do that in real time. Um, the other one, which I think is really cool, um, is we do real-time... Uh, pseudonymization. So let's say you collect, uh, you sign up, you sign up to a website, and the user ID is an email address, uh, as is common for most places. Um, you can actually hash that value in real time um, whilst the event has been processed before it lands and is stored at rest. So you can choose anything. I think we support like MD2, MD5, SHA1, all the way up to like SHA526. You can salt it as well. And User ID is an obvious one, but you can do, you know, uh, any, any feel, any value that you collect uh, with Snowplow, you can do real-time uh, obfuscation of it. And what's great about that is because, because you hash it, every unique value will still remain unique. So you can still do count the stinks, you can still count up unique users, count up unique account IDs or something, or addresses or something. And if you've got that data in the back end somewhere, like, again, we look at email addresses as an example. If you've got the user's email addresses in a backend system that you want to join with Snowplow, well, all you have to do is use BigQuery's SHA-256 function, rehash all of your emails from your backend database, and then you can run effective joins and still merge all that data without necessarily ever knowing what the email addresses were, uh, which is um, um, uh, very attractive to people who are concerned about holding onto information like that. Yeah, I think, I think that's attractive for not only from the privacy point of view, but also the security point of view. Like if if you, you know, if you if you just if you follow security Twitter, which is always fascinating to me. Like you know, you can follow all these hackers while they're live reporting on what they find. Anyone isn't following malware tech on Twitter, go find him. He's fantastic. He's the guy who found the uh, ransomware that hit the NHS and uh, deactivated it for a while. He's great. So and and there's also. Um, uh, Zach Edwards is also uh, a uh, yeah researcher on that topic. Uh, they, they publish great content, but if you follow them, then you become aware of how how many things get hacked. You know, like 
co- companies obviously don't want this stuff to get out, so they try to downplay it as much as possible. But you you should, I think it's fair to assume it's probably best to operate from the assumption that you will get hacked eventually. So all the hashing of anything you can do is probably, you know, you probably want to go down that route. Everyone, uh, one of the sayings I heard from a, 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 a technology person speaking once was like, you know, build things like you're going to be, like you build things like you're being attacked because you will be. Like you, you, yeah. you cannot assume that no one is going to try and get into your data because they will be. And you need to put those, even if you think, oh, no one's going to be interested in our web behavioral data in our big yeah. query. Like that's like, don't want to sound offensive, but like it's pretty naive and pretty a, a poor approach, a poor way to think about it. Like you have to assume, you always have yeah. to assume the worst and code for the worst. And yeah. Hashing is the most is the de facto way uh, nowadays. SHA two five six. Don't do anything less. Don't do SHA one two eight. Definitely don't do SHA one two five six or five twelve. SHA five twelve. Sorry, um, uh, definitely is the is is the way to go. And anything that you think might be sensitive data, really. Yeah, because what one of the things like I also used to think like for, for a lot of my clients, so like there's no value in this data set, perhaps to their direct competitors, right? But then once I started following this uh, this uh, Zach Edwards that I just told you about, like he is basically exposing like ad fraud online and how they are basically using all those identifiers to mimic real hits. So there, there's value to all data sets. You, we just don't realize it like for, for what kind of nefarious use they're going to they're gonna take it. Actually mentioning that, so your, one of your first questions was about like user identifiers in the browser and cookie values. You can hash them using the same mechanism. So you can use the same uh, PII pseudonymization enrichment we actually do this on our own site if you want to go, well, I want to say, but all of the cookie values, which are like normally UUIDs, and they're obviously stored in the browser. When we collect them, we hash them with SHA-256 with a salt. So like to us, it's just a random string. We don't, as an analyst, we don't really care. Like say you still, you know, do count stakes, you can do, still do session stitching. But I have a, I'm have looking at a completely different user ID value, cookie ID value, than what actually is stored in the user's browser. So I can't even theoretically find out what the user's um, cookie ID is. Yeah, and, and, and from a, well, now, now that all, almost all browsers have, you know, locked down the, the, the ways of third-party cookies, uh, third-party scripts and what they can do, but before what they would basically do is, tr- you know, th- those, those share buttons that everybody included on their, on their website, you know, they would just harvest everything they could find and then just map out how you would browse the web. Like those were the real, privacy infringing uh, techniques and that that could have been stopped by these kind of these kind of techniques yeah uh, cookie stealing is still a valid attack on the on web browsers like people uh, slightly less now because it requires cross site scripting and most people are a bit aware of it but essentially if you can act, act, uh, rem- remotely execute some javascript on a user's browser back their cookie you can impersonate them and you can pretend to be them when you go try to log into the Amazon. So we're, going to, we're taking a bit of a tangent, but I find, I find this stuff really interesting as well. Yeah, well, pe- people who listen to the podcast probably also do. Like, we're the audience, right? So this, <laughs> this is good. <laughs> um, yeah, so so if I, if I distill all of this, like, basically more options and more flexibility, and also, like, you guys developed most of it right like i think it's open source so probably there's also contributions for other from others but i think the snowplow core team is definitely doing the bulk of it i would say yeah we do we we, we get contributions back every so often uh it, de- it depends on the piece of tech right the scala um uh jackie sdk doesn't get a lot of contributions outside the core team because not many people are doing tracking in Scala or, or or something but the javascript tracker the ios and android tracker we get quite a lot of contributions we had a contribution from a customer last week on one of our dbt models that's really cool um mm. so uh yeah that, uh, but it, yeah to answer your question is mainly that mainly our core engineers yeah but then yeah so so the, so the value is there there is already you know it's not like building from scratch which would be like the most extreme alternative right this is like i feel like in between off the shelf SaaS, right google analytics snippet throw it on and then build it yourself is on the other end of the spectrum and snowplow is 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 right in between there we get we get quite a few prospects every now and then who have come from a world where they have done that they've built their own they've gone like we've got we're a big company we've got a big set of engineers and sres 
we reckon we can do this ourselves. How hard can it be? Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I could, I would potentially argue, in fact, I would certainly argue that first of all, we're better at it because we've been doing it for so we've been doing this specific build a product to do the specific type of thing for 10 years now. We've been around for 10 years now. Um, like, yeah, I'm sure you've got really good engineers and SREs and developers, but like they have, they've been building your products. They've been building your things. Why on earth do you think they will be as good as we would be? Uh, which might sound a bit like arrogant, but I don't, I don't think it's a, an unreasonable thing to say, but I would also potentially argue that if you have rolled it yourself, like all of these things, I actually mentioned this in my Michigan talk as well. Like there's probably loads of things that you haven't even thought of that will only be, become apparent to you when you start building it. And privacy and security are one, uh, uh, you know, two big things in what you'll have to consider when you're building your own tooling, uh, data access, like persistence, um, retention policies, uh, access rights, um, you know, what values are you storing? What's the entropy of those values? Likelihood of you being unique, likelihood of them being tracked back to what the users were. Like that's like so much stuff and that's not even really considering actually building the core functionality, right? That's not even thinking about how you actually track page views or link clicks or conversions, right? And how you manage it and stuff. So I would potentially argue that even if you do go to the other end of that spectrum and build it yourself, you're still potentially liable. Maybe I shouldn't use the word liable. You're still potentially uh, running the risk of, um, you know, not building it in a privacy centric or, or secure way. Um, whereas obviously we've taken a lot of time and a lot of effort to build in these features to help. To, to give users this functionality. You told the story of uh, Alex, uh, Alex and Yali thinking of, Let, we should build this ourselves. The first thing I thought was, well, they, they probably they probably thought that and then they figured out, oh shit, this is this is quite a bit harder <laughs> than, we, than we thought. <laughs> I, I know, yeah, I actually had to, I actually, uh, for, um, for something we're doing internally, I had to go back to the very first GitHub commit on github.com slash snowplow slash snowplow. Um, which was back in 2012, and it's a very different product. <laughs> it was extremely basic. Um, like it was a JavaScript tracker, a collector application, um, and the, and then uh, an S3 loader and a Redshift loader. I think that was it. Like literally, like four components. And now we have like 27 Jacking SDKs in 27 different languages, two clouds, four warehouses. Um, yeah, it's um, it's 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 a really really big tech estate we have these days. The privacy and the security are, are two things, but then also like, just think about having to deal with all these different browsers and different browser versions supporting all that, and then the different uh, mobile, uh, you know, mobile assets. Like it's wh whenever whenever a company says to me like, yeah, we're we're gonna build our own. Uh, API like extracted to get the data out of Facebook and Google and whatever. I'm like, okay, but please, you, I would use Stitch or Five Trend or Supermetrics or whatever because you don't want to support it. Like, why would you, right? Like, it's probably not going to be worth it. So, I know it's, I see that. Uh, I, I I am guilty of doing things like that in the past. I wrote extractors from using R to to do stuff like that. We had people in my organization doing the same with Python scripts and. I think that's a very prevalent. I think a lot of people around the world who do that, but like, like just just, off, just give it to someone who's done this. Yeah, but and 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 who will maintain it? You know, like like if what if if you know that when Facebook changes the way the API works, you're gonna find out three weeks later, and it's already broken for three weeks, right? Like that that's that stuff's gonna happen. Like it's it's most of the times it's not worth it. So in that case, you know, like uh, I, I like I like where Snowplow is positioned, like in between of building it all yourself, but also not off the shelf SaaS. It's, it, it, this middle ground, I feel, is uh, is a good place to be. Or, And I think it has become a good place to be. Like, I don't think it really, I think Snowplow grew into that role, so to say. Mm. I think, yeah, I think so. I think like, um, like one of our, one of our positioning messages is that like, you know, you get a tool of, you get a tool built by the engineers of the quality of like the Netflix and the Amazons of the world who have built all of this, the Spotify's of the world who've built all of this stuff themselves because they have an army of developers who they can dedicate to this particular task. Most organizations can't dedicate that kind of resource. They don't have the money, the, you know, the, the people in place, 
organization size, time, priorities, they can't do that themselves. They can come to us and get a product of that scale and and complexity and, and, and flexibility, but still run it in their own cloud, right? And still have it integrate with their own applications and, and build their own recommendation engines, and build their own personalization uh, decisioning engines and stuff like that. Um, which is, which I think is a nice, like, you know, we, there's lots of companies who want to do those things and don't have the engineering capabilities, you know, like there's no even where to start. Like, so, you know, if we can, you know, help them get to that point without not have to worry about maintenance and getting up in the middle of the night and the weekend when your server's falling over, and, um, having SREs, expensive SREs, having to monitor it, monitor it 24 seven, like we can take that away from them. Then we, we, we think we add a lot of value. Well that, well, that ties in nicely to uh, to what I want to ask you. Let's say people listening to this podcast, you know, they're, they're probably in, t- they, ha- they have an affinity with digital marketing, digital analytics, and, you know, they, they're interested in this, this privacy topic and how it's affecting them. So now they're considering Snowplow, right? After, after this raging review <laughs> by you and me. Um, so they can go down. They can. They have two options, right? They can. They have the open source option, or uh, get it via you guys uh, and have you guys uh, run it for them. So let's take that last option first, because I think that's the easiest. It will cost, obviously, uh, you know, it will cost them money to hire you guys. What would they need on their end? So you guys run the stack for them, right? So you take that out of their hands. What would you recommend, like from a like the, the marketing manager or the CMO listening to this, he's like, okay, maybe I want to go down that route. What kind of people would he need if he goes down that route? Most of these businesses will have like good front end resource. So like if you want to, if we're, we're seeing become more popular to actually build Snowplow tracking into your application, into your website, like into the source code, have front end developers do that. A lot of benefits to that, loads faster, less weight in the, bl- in the browser, uh, nicer developer experience developer checks and tests, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we can also run in GTM. We've got, uh, we published a GTM template, uh, which generates a GUI inside GTM for adding a uh, new tags. So if you've already got front end developers and already got like, you know, GTM analysts and people who can do that, you can get up and running with Snowplow. Um, like that shouldn't be a blocker. Most companies have that kind of like well covered at this point. Um, the real space what I would say, as I think, is from my experience, the gap that I see the most in organizations that maybe prevents Snowplow from being a fantastic fit for them right now is on the opposite end of the dial, or opposite end of the pipeline is the consuming the data in BigQuery. I will actually hat tip my, give a hat tip to Google here. Uh, giving BigQuery export out for free with GA4 is a wonderful thing. Uh, I know it's not free, and it, well, it is free to a limit, but the idea that they've put event-level data in the hands of more people so more people are getting used to writing queries in BigQuery and using BI tools like Looker and, and generating cool data models in, in, in a data warehouse with web and behavioral data and mobile data is fantastic. Uh, welcome, Google. I think it's a really, really good move. So it, it is growing in that space. People, maybe like ourselves, who are from digital marketing, digital analytics backgrounds, wouldn't have, wouldn't have had those skills and don't have those skills if, if that hasn't happened. So that is a space that you do need people you need people who are comfortable writing sql there's a tool mostly you've probably heard of called dbt which we leverage quite a lot to make writing sql data models converting the event by event data in a very very deep very very wide table into a set of more easy to understand easy to consume uh tables that are easier for an analyst to look at and an easier for an analyst to query and easier for your tools to consume because you don't want Tableau having to run very, very complicated table calculations or, or, or whatever to calculate something very straightforward. You want it to query a very nice, uh, sanitized, clean, uh, aggregated table. Um, uh, the role, the titles of these people is now basically been settled on as an analytics engineer. The idea of someone who can sit and write production grade SQL uh, against a, a raw data set to convert them into, into more simple to use tables. Uh, that is def- that is a it's a borderline mandatory, I would say, because that's the main way that we deliver data, right? Uh, yeah. And um, you know, we 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 think we deliver the best quality data to the data warehouse from behavioral applications, but um, uh, it, it 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 isn't usable 
isn't always usable straight out of the box. It depends on your use case. And we do have DBT models that do a lot of this for you. Um, but yeah, if you want to be able to go, right, okay, we've just launched uh, a new feature on our website. We want a funnel chart to show uh, usage of that new feature over time, sliceable by device and by customer type, you know, whatever. Right, well, someone's going to have to turn that event data into something that Tableau or Looker or, or um, you know, Holistics or Power BI or whatever tool you're using, Data Studio, whatever, can consume. Um, so, yeah, that's probably the biggest thing that you... Um, you'd want to look for, I think. Yeah. And then there's other th- and then there's other things like, you know, being able to translate business requirements into tracking designs. We have this idea of custom schemas where we have custom events and custom entities deciding what you decide what a user looks like. You decide what a product looks like. You decide what uh, a, a bi- an organization looks like. You decide what uh, a listing, whatever these things are on your website or your apps, you decide what they are. You decide what all the properties they have um, and how they should look and then translate that into actual tracking code. And then that's what will land in your warehouse. So there's like linking up business prop, you know, uh, you know, uh, data strategists, you know, um, those kinds, you know, uh, people, yeah. business analysts kind of tr- converting or translating business requirements into Snowplow entities, Snowplow con- uh, uh, custom schemas and concepts that can then be translated into tracking code which can then be translated into a data model in the warehouse. So, But the main yeah. technical role is that analytics engineer, is our SQL engineer um, working in the warehouse. And then obviously, I, I didn't touch on it as much because it's more in place in more places as I've seen. But yeah, the front-end people, people who can implement you know, good quality tracking code in your website or your applications. I just realized this, we didn't mention this, but people people were uh, not really aware of Snowplow, like Snowplow, you, you don't get a graphical user interface, right? So, so you, there, there, um, you know, you, you, you need to choose your tool of choice, uh, how you want to visualize on top of it. So that, that's, that's, uh, that's important. Like if, if you compare it to, to Google Analytics, you get the data model, you get everything that's under the hood, but you don't get, you know, you don't get the, the, the graphical user interface. So you, you have a lot of choice there, which is also great, right? And, and you can switch them, right? It doesn't really matter. Like, so that's a benefit, but it is something to keep in. Uh, in the back of your head. Yeah, sorry, uh, I uh, sorry, I may have lost some of that. Yeah, but uh, Looker and Tableau, Looker and Tableau, very very popular uh, in the space. Power BI again, uh, very popular. There's some nice upstart holistics, or a nice tool they're out of uh, somewhere in East Asia, Singapore. I think they do. They they've got a new nice new tool that, that's looking really nice. But yeah, um, uh, Looker and Tableau, and then or if you've got a bunch of data scientists, uh, R Python. Get that get get access to that same data. Use ggplot if you use R like I used to. Uh, yeah, whatever tool you choose. If you go down the route of hiring you guys for the data engineering part, then having an analytics engineer, which is basically going to be in between the people who consume the data, like people who need reports, who need you know answers, uh, and basically handling that raw data set that Snowplow will will deliver and modeling on top of that and making sure that uh, in the end they get something in a graphical user interface of choice that they can interpret and make a decision upon, right? So that's a, that's an essential person to have uh, in the organization. Exactly. You can't expect a product manager or a marketing analyst to know to know SQL to a high level. Uh, it's just not realistic. And um, like, I, I think every analyst, everyone who's got analysts in their job title should know how to write some SQL. It's not the case. It makes sense, right? They're not in it to write code. They're here to figure out what best to do for their next marketing campaign, or best to what what next decision they want to make on this feature that they just launched. Like they don't, they shouldn't have to be able to write SQL necessarily to get those answers. So having somebody who can serve those answers to them um, uh, is is very important. Okay, and let's say let's say we go down the open source route, right? So uh, I don't want to hire you guys, but I do want to use your uh, your cool open source pro- product. I still would need the analytics engineer, right? Because the because the end result will be will be the same. What what would be the extra what would be the extra people I would need to set this up? Like bare minimum kind of setup. So you would need some SREs. So for everyone who's not familiar, SREs are site reliability engineers, um, or DevOps engineers, uh, or cloud ops or cloud engineers essentially. So Snowflow is made up of multiple components. We have a collector, we have a validator, we have an enrichment app, we've got warehouse loaders, et cetera. And those applications need to run somewhere. 
So we, so when we deploy Snowplow, we are opinionated about how we deploy it. When you know we have a view on what type of server it should be running on, how it should be running, how it should be configured. Um, but you know that's just that's just our approach. If you have some site some SREs, you know you can take our uh, collector application and choose to run it on whatever server you wish. So if you're you know if you're using um, GCP, maybe you'll run it on App Engine. Maybe you'll spin up Cloud VM. Uh, maybe you'll use managed Kubernetes, which is what we do. Uh, you'll run it there, and you'll need SREs who are familiar with Kubernetes, or if you're on Amazon, like EC2 or, or, or whatever, to be able to set those servers up, install the application, and then you know all the other applications, you know, network them together properly so they speak to each other and they do the right thing in the right order. Um, a data engineer as well. So uh, the difference I would say between a data engineer and a site reliability engineer. So the data engineer builds, in our case anyway, the data engineers build those applications. They build the Snowplow collector. They build the data warehouse loader, et cetera. And then the SRE would look, would uh, configure what that application runs on. So if you're running our tech open source, maybe you want to fork what we've, what we've done because you have some other use cases, having some having a data engineer who's familiar with Scala or Java, most of our components are written in Scala, uh, which is very popular in the data engineering space. Having some Scala engineers who can look through our code, you know, make necessary adjustments or forks if they need to or want to, uh, probably is also not a bad idea, but definitely DevOps or SREs in terms of setting it up and running it and making sure it keeps running. In that case, you're talking about a team of at least three people, right? Including the analytics engineer, three, likely four. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would say so. It depends on your scale. Like we have customers that send 5 billion events a day um, to, to their Snowblow pipeline. And that pipeline is significantly bigger than someone who sends hundreds of millions a month and uh, also more expensive. <laughs> um, and, uh, but also like potentially more business critical, right? Which means it needs to be up all the time. Now we manage yeah, pipeline for us, but the, the the bigger the scale, the more volume that you're plowing through your pipeline, you need more servers to cope with it. You need to network together more physical bits, physical machinery uh, to keep them running all the time. So it, I don't think it's quite, um, I don't think it's quite linear, but as your volume goes up, you will start to need more and more people to manage it. Which makes sense, right? Yeah, and, and, and there's the business criticality increases because uh some people snowplow goes down for a few hours like that's fine like they're doing daily reports that's fine right we can we can wait for it to come back up online rebatch everything and then we're up and going some businesses can't afford some businesses use snowplowers like to power their own products and monetize the data they come out of snowplow and they can't afford any downtime so as the criticality goes up probably the more people you'll want to dedicate to that that's, you know, like, for, I, I especially wanted to get your insights on, like, the, the entry levels, right? Because then for people, they can imagine, like, okay, what, what, are, what are we talking about, right? Like, from a, from a budget point of view, like, okay, you would need, you know, this amount of people to, to, to consider that move uh, to see if it makes sense for you. If you're interested in open source, then the route I would recommend is something that we call open source quick start. So we've got AWS quick start and GCP quick start. Um, these are sets of uh, Terraform scripts. So Terraform is uh, uh, infrastructure as code. Essentially, what it does is a set of commands that will go off to your AWS account and spin up all of the things for you. You run two commands in a terminal window, and you could have a full Snowplow pipeline up and running for you. It it will be all the components. It will be all of the applications within the pipeline. So the collector, the validator, enrich the loader, and the, and, the, and the database for you to. Uh, query data in. Um, it won't be production scale. It's designed to be quick to spin up. So it's not quite like I wouldn't put like a full production website set of traffic at it. But if you want to get to see what our open source looks like and you want to see what applications run and, 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 and what they're doing and how they work together, uh, uh, I think it's github.com slash no plow slash quick start dash examples. We're going to put it in the in the links. <laughs> yeah, just clone those, clone that repo, choose whether you're on AWS or GCP. You do need access to an environment. Uh, you, fill in a, you fill in a few val uh, variables and values in a couple of the scripts. TF apply, 
and then wait a few minutes and you've got a snowplowing point to send data to. I've personally done this, mucked around with it a bit. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's a nice weekend project to, uh, to explore. I, I demoed this uh, in my major camp talk in real time in front of everybody over my phone, Wi-Fi, because I couldn't get the building's Wi-Fi to work. Well, so, and I also had to connect to my company's VPN to get it to work, <laughs> um, but it still worked and it still spun up in, I think, about four or five minutes. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a nice, it's quite a nice, fun, fun little thing to have a try. And, and if you want to, if you are considering uh, Snowplow, either open source or, or, or coming to us to manage it, um, it's a nice way to, you know, see what it, you know, look under the hood, see what it's doing. You can send data to, I think we spin up a Postgres database, so we'll send data to there. You can run some queries. We load in real time as well, so you can literally like put the tracking on your website in GTM, click a few things, and then do select start from events, and you get all of the things that you've just triggered. Um, so that's what I put. Yeah, if you want to get a flavor of what it looks like and what it's like to use, uh, that's a really good approach. Yeah, definitely the, the place to start. Okay, last question, then we're going to we're gonna drop off. Um, how about running all of Snowplow, not on AWS, not on GCP, but on some yet unknown to me EU-based cloud provider? Mm -hmm. Oh, on-premise. Well, um, no, not necessarily on-prem, but like e fully EU-based. Like I don't, I don't know if there is a good competitor to AWS and GCP in in the EU, but let's let's assume there is. Is that is that even a possibility? Is it on the roadmap? So it's not really possible right now. The reason for that is um, we leverage some cloud-specific technology on each AWS and GCP. So on AWS, we leverage Amazon Kinesis for the real-time stream. Uh, same on GCP, we utilize PubSub as our streaming platform. Um, you know, hypothetical EU-based cloud company doesn't have those services, so we'd have to build our real-time application using whatever the cloud could provide there. Uh, however, it is definitely on the roadmap. What, we, what we're trying to do, and I hope I don't get too technical for people, but we're basically trying to take all of these applications that we've, that we've built and essentially make them transportable. So rather than be tied to AWS services or tied to GCP services, essentially make them a Docker, a Dockerized container, which you can then run in Kubernetes. And if it's a Dockerized container, you can run it anywhere that you can run Docker, which is basically anywhere. Yeah. So a hypothetical EU cloud offers you manage Kubernetes or a way of running servers, spin up Docker, install our applications, all the, all the individual applications into Docker containers, and now you can run Snowplow on. In theory, anywhere you wish, you can run it on a separate cloud, you can run it on Azure, you can run it on-prem. If you've, uh, you know, a lot of businesses still run a lot of things on-premise. If you want to, you could hypothetically run it there as well. We're quite a bit, we're unfortunately quite a bit away from that being a reality, simply because we've got such a big tech stack, right? We've got such a, a huge estate and it's, uh, you know, we need to battle test it. We need to, uh, you know, make it production ready. Um, however, it's definitely on our roadmap. Um, I'm not going to say roughly when I think it will be because my engineering team will shout at me. So, um, but it, it is definitely something that we're working towards. Yeah. Okay. Really cool. Because uh, yeah, that's you know, like from the from the privacy angle, the I, the big fear for me as like the marketing manager of a certain company would be, oh no, I, I now migrated to Snowplow to to evade away from this, but but I'm still hosting Snowplow on on AWS or Google, and it's still a US based company. So you know. It, it didn't uh, it didn't result in any uh, any positive outcome for me so being able to do it on the eu cloud would be uh, you know would be really the the best uh, outcome there's a lot to be said isn't there i mean there was a while ago, a thing a while ago where people were saying the privacy advocates are coming after the public clouds um because amazon are still an american company google are obviously an american company so even if the servers are on here in the eu then you're still potentially sending data to to these American companies. I think that's slightly over, over hyped. I don't think that's likely. You can do things like bring your own key uh, on Amazon and GCP. So even Amazon or Google can't you know, break through your encryption and can't access your data. And also if they did that, then the internet would stop working. <laughs> if you decided that you're not allowed to use Amazon or GCP, then like the internet in Europe stops working. It seems like they were gunning for it. So, you know, if, if you could be one step ahead, like I think the, the, the solution you just described with uh, everything running uh, via Kubernetes and Docker, like 
you know like if people want to go the extreme route and they find some 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 cloud host in their own country where they can host it all and, and feel like totally 100 percent safe about it i could imagine like if you're going to make this investment you might want to make take that extra step as well it, i mean that's 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 very future proof right you could just like i said you could just spin up a servers and spin up some servers in your office and run it there if you really wanted to then you're really not you know um risking anything but that's a that's a pretty hard line to take i would say um and uh but yeah it depends on your appetite for for risk i guess well cool that you guys are at least working on it i've taken up a lot of your time uh it was a cool talk I learned a lot um is there anything else you want to share before we uh before we drop off we'll, we'll throw all the links in the in the show notes to everything that you you referenced but uh, is there anything else you want to you want to add not, 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 nothing much more to add. Just, um, I think you're doing a great job, Rick, and bringing all of this to, to more mass attention. I think that, as I mentioned earlier, just because you use X tool does not mean you're GDPR compliant. You know, look at the, look at the mechanisms that are available to you to make sure you're doing this correctly, right? And, and, uh, we put a lot of effort into, uh, options and flexibility to making those things possible. But whatever tool you're using, um, uh, yeah, make sure that, you know, really, it should be more front of mind than ever, um, and uh, I think I think it is. I think people are starting to realize that this can't be an afterthought. I think that's a good thing to uh, to close the podcast on. Thank you for joining. No worries. Thanks, Rich. Thanks for having me.